Thank you very much for coming here, Mr. Patel. It's really an honor to have you here and uh, speak to us about the aviation sector in India globally. Under your leadership, uh, India's aviation sector has, of course, experienced tremendous growth as well as some ups and downs, of course, uh, in recent times due to some external factors. How do you see the aviation market shaping up, both in India and abroad, but especially, do you see that India will buck the trend, recover faster, and uh, really help the global aviation market to recover more quickly as well? Well, you're right. India is uh, a major aviation market now. It wasn't so just a few years ago. In fact, it's almost now the ninth largest aviation market in the world. And uh, it went through a couple of years of very high growth, 2005, six, and seven especially. We saw growth in the high 20s and 30s. And uh, in 2008, the oil price rise and then subsequently the world recession have impacted uh, aviation worldwide and in India too. And I feel that uh, uh, the last quarter especially has been very encouraging in India. We've seen about 25% uh, growth, but I don't uh, look at it at that high numbers for the whole year. Maybe even a 15% growth will be quite good, and that would be in a way leading uh, aviation back on the path of recovery. Undoubtedly, given the population, the economic growth that's projected, we do expect growth, and so this may have been a small bump um, with these various external factors. You've obviously worked on the policy side quite a bit, you know, in terms of aviation infrastructure. I believe that uh, India is headed on a good path to really modernize airports, air traffic control, and so forth. Um, how do you view, though, bilateral rights, for instance? This has been one of those discussion points. Have Indian carriers benefited or been disadvantaged? Obviously, competition is good for the consumer. We all know that. Where do you strike the balance? Because that must have been one of these aspects which you've had to deal with very, very uh, uh, critically uh, over time. You're right. In fact, one of the key areas what we worked is on the regulatory side, especially more on the technical regulation. But as far as uh, uh, the overall sector, I think it has only grown because we have, in a way, uh, sought to free it of uh, government control. And it has helped the Indian consumer usually. It's helped the country, it's helped the economy, it's helped tourism. And uh, that is the reason, I think, uh, today, uh, you find that India is uh, being recognized as an aviation power. But that notwithstanding, I think uh, it's very important that we balance uh, the growth in a methodical way. We uh, have uh, now very liberal uh, aviation agreements with many countries, so we see more flights of other countries coming to and from India. We also have uh, an open skies agreement with the United States, first of its kind, and I think uh, that has also shown that we have a lot more connectivity now between India and the U.S., but of course much more will happen in the future. But it's, it's a question of you know balancing uh, uh, the needs of a country the local airlines, the domestic airlines, also must have an equal level playing field. So on one side, while we've opened up the international skies, on the home front, we still have a lot of, uh, I would say, a regulation in terms of we don't allow foreign airlines yet to operate within India. But I think over a period of time, it's a calibrated approach. The, as and when we go along the road, we will also be you know, balancing uh, and uh, opening up progressively. Is the balance between low-cost carriers and the full-service carriers the appropriate one right now? Well, I think it's not a question of choice. I think it's a compulsion. All airlines, as we've been talking earlier, is the cost of uh, operations, the pressure on the yields, and uh, the shrinking customer base in case you increase fares. So I think a combination of this has forced all airlines worldwide to look at uh, cutting costs. And especially the full service and the legacy carriers have not been able to reduce cost as uh, you know efficiently as they would have liked to. You know you can't suddenly dismantle the high costs and the old structures. Whereas in the case of the lower cost carriers, they came in afresh. They didn't have to go through the learning curve or the pressures of you know having a larger organization, and that's why. They have been able to wean away a lot of customers, even in India, almost more than 55% of air travel now is with the lower cost segment. 
So it's, it's happening all over the world. It's happening in Europe. It's happening in America. It's happening in Asia. And it's happening in India. So as a result of which, I think we will have to see a transition uh, in a larger uh, percentage to uh, migrating from the full service or uh, legacy carriers to the lower cost model. Makes sense, especially given the distribution of our population's income, right? And no, and in India, problems. you see the issues uh, are of uh, travel between one city or the other is not more than maximum travel is two hours. So uh, in, in that kind of a situation domestically, it makes absolute sense to have a lower cost model. Also, in the near region, like the Middle East, where a large Indian expat population is there, distances are not more than three or four hours. So, or Southeast Asia, where a lot of travel is involved between India and those countries. So as a result of which, uh, you see the lower cost model uh, in the domestic or the near region would be definitely making a lot more sense in future. On the cost side, one of the important factors is, like you mentioned, uh, oil and fuel. Now, Indian carriers are disadvantaged by the fact that the taxes are so high on the aviation fuel. Now, I know you've been uh, trying to advocate for lowering this, and this is in the state's hands uh, to a large extent. How do you think that can be, can be tackled? Because we are operating at a cost disadvantage um, vis-a-vis others, and that's not translating into a competitive advantage, but a, co a competitive disadvantage at this stage. No, I do agree that... Uh Taxation, at least on fuel, is something a cause of concern for Indian carriers. And uh, as the whole industry, as also the ministry, we see reason in that demand for lower taxes. Uh, well, it's not been easy so far to be able to convince uh, various states, especially because in India we have the states which uh, actually collect local taxes, and they find it as uh, a, a generous way to make money. So I don't want to comment on their uh, reason, but the fact is, yes, this does put a pressure. And that's why, one of the reasons why, because fixed costs cannot be uh, brought down or the fuel cost cannot be brought down. Therefore, the lower cost model is uh, probably being more successful in terms of you know trying to reduce cost on the other fronts. Yeah. And finally, I want to turn a little bit towards uh, Air India and Indian Airlines and the merger. I will tell you my bias, and that is I believe in the merger. Um, and I've openly done that because I believe the strategic compulsion is there to have domestic and international combined. But obviously, the challenge has been to integrate appropriately. So I don't see it as a flawed decision in terms of doing it. The question is, is the integration too complex to ever be possible, or can it be done in some structured fashion? And uh, I know you've been working on this. There are various committees, and we see comments. How can this be approached so that the implementation piece is successful and effective? Because I think operationally and strategically, the compulsion is just there. No, I do agree that uh, the merger, as you rightly said, is uh, uh, makes imminent sense. It's it's not something which we decided uh, knee jerk uh, that we need to do this. I think there was a lot of thought process, well uh, intentioned, well advised, and uh, what's actually not really gone right is that the two entities uh, have uh, slightly cultural uh, differences. Well, it's not insurmountable, but uh, probably a little bit of resistance from the people who work in both the organizations has led to this situation. But I don't think it is going to be, uh, you know, impossible to solve. We are working on it. Delayed, though, a little bit uh, not as uh, well uh, uh, executed as planned. But at the end of the day, I think uh, in a year or two, we will be able to make it uh, a fully functional merger. I hope so. I mean, especially uh, with the IT platform. Frankly speaking, I know that that was not entirely the government of India's fault because the providers also were unable to deliver on a uh, technical solution and, and combining and harmonizing the reservation systems. Now, you've also launched, of course, this uh, COO search, a very public one, and uh, uh, our understanding is the five shortlisted candidates are uh, expats of various kinds, and various names have been floated, including people like Wolfgang Maya Huba might be part of the mix because he's leaving Lufthansa, Singapore Airlines executives, and so forth. Uh, I don't know if you can give us a hint of what might be coming, but I wanted to ask you the role of that person, because my understanding is that COO will st uh, still operate under the ministry and then under Arvind Jadhav. No, uh, I, so I, how I, will it work? You know? No, I, 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 on the first, on the 
the PSS system, I think uh, they've sorted it out and uh, by the end of this year, the PSS uh, integrated system will be functional. So that is one major concern which has been, uh, I think, uh, addressed. The other issue is about the COO. Uh, well, uh, see, uh, Air India is uh, not directly, uh, you know, reporting to the ministry on a day-to-day -day basis. They have a board and they have been now given an even further uh, impetus by uh, giving an independent board of directors with eminent people like Anand Mahindra and Amit Mitra. And uh, they will be, I'm sure, able to take decisions on their own. Government is only a shareholder and therefore naturally would like to know what's happening, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't want to interfere. The COO will uh, bring in more professionalism, while the CMD, of course, is the overall, uh, you know, the administrator of the airline and uh, would uh, definitely be in, uh, the end person to be accountable. But he needs strong professional hands, and especially aviation being a complex business, a global business, it's always nicer to have a professional COO. And uh, I don't know who's going to be eventually shortlisted. There's an independent uh, panel which is uh, going to interview these candidates and uh, hopefully appoint one. But I would be only saying this, that uh, we as government are very keen, as shareholders also, to be having a first-rate airline and a profitable airline. So let's, uh, you know, support them in whatever ways possible. I, I like that attitude, especially on the autonomy side. And personally, having traveled uh, on the JFK to India routes, I can see how the airline can go back to its glorious days because those are first-rate products. So especially as the route rationalization is also taking place, please think about the future growth of the airline and the position. I would hate to see the airline lose the uh, flag carrier or national carrier status, uh, which it has. Final question I wanted to ask you is on FDI in the aviation sector. Has been talked about for a while. Um, obviously, there's a careful balance of the needs financially, uh, professionally, but also protecting to some extent and giving equal playing fields for the local carriers. What is your stand on this? Um, how should this be done? No, FTI is, uh, I would say, a fairly reasonable uh, percentage. It's 49 at the moment. And uh, I think uh, some stage... Uh, you know, we can look at things in future. But as of now, I think 49 is a good percentage of FDI in the airline side. But in terms of aviation-related, uh, uh, like airport infrastructure, greenfield airports, you can have 100%. In the Mumbai, Delhi, and the joint ventures of Hyderabad and Bangalore, we have 74% FDI. So there are, uh, I would say, many incentives for cargo airlines, for non-scheduled operations. We have very liberal FDI regime. So I think it's a calibrated approach and as we feel the requirement would be there for more capital for airlines maybe we look at it more objectively thank you very much I've enjoyed the insights as I'm sure all the uh, viewers will also do thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. yeah